Now, I want to, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing a series here. Uh, I, actually, I was doing this in my couples class, so I'm just going to take what I was doing over there and just bring it over here into this class. And I want to talk to you about the subject of apologetics. And let me back up and say, you know, the, this is going to be like a Bible class. Some of you might know that I teach uh, as an adjunct for Faith Theological, and also I do some adjunct work for uh, Crown Seminary in Tennessee. Every once in a while, they'll call me down there to do an intensive where I'll teach Master of Divinity students on different topics and different subjects. And, that, and a week intensive is when you take a whole semester's worth of work and you cram it into one week. You know, you just teach all day, and uh, they have to listen to me all day for the whole week, and then they have all kind of assignments they got to pass in and this, that, and the other. So I do some of these intensives. I do uh, class here at Faith throughout, the, you know, here in Baltimore. Um, I teach on Thursday to them. So I'm just going to treat you like my seminary class. Is that okay? All right, so you are now in the Harmon Baptist Theological Seminary. So you're going, to be, you're going to be taking a class here, and some of the stuff I'm be, I share with them, I'm going to share with you. And uh, what I want to do in this class is kind of also make it a bit uh, informal in the sense that I want some feedback from you. I might ask you a question. I might say if you have a comment, something that you want to, um, you know, ask about or talk about. So we're going to treat it more like a classroom. Is that okay? And, um, and so I have two mics down here, wireless mics, and I might ask maybe one of you gentlemen, if you could uh, maybe take a mic to somebody who has a question or has a comment, and uh, maybe, um, you know, Brother Brian or Brother Pennington, you know, you could just grab that mic and then just hand it to someone if they have a question about anything. So the topic that I'm going to be dealing with here today is the topic of apologetics. That's what we want to talk about. And the question is then, what is apologetics? When we talk about apologetics, what do we mean? What are we talking about? And uh, oh, by the way, we didn't pray, did we? Let me, let me pray. Well, we actually prayed two times, but let me pray. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here and to teach your word. And I pray that you'll bless um, the word as it goes out. Help me, Lord, as a teacher of your word to be clear. And uh, I pray that, that, that as a result of this, that they'll be built up in the knowledge of you uh, not only just in their mind academically, but more important spiritually as we live out your truth in this world today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the question is, what is apologetics? Now, what I'd like you to do is take your Bible and open to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15. If you'll open to that passage this morning, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And uh, I want you to look at this verse here. Uh, scholars like to use a technical term for particular texts of Scripture, and they call this the locus classicus. You say, well, what is that, locus classicus? That's just a, uh, a Latin term that simply means classical location. And this term, uh, you know, is uh, used when a scholar or a teacher wants to, uh, to, to say that this is a particular a text that supports a certain discipline and a certain doctrine. Um, it's just really a fancy way of calling attention to what is used to support a discipline. In other words, they'll say this is the, if they're teaching on a topic, they'll say this is the classical verse that teaches this discipline, this topic that we're going to talk about. And they call it the locus classicus. And so the locus classicus, the typical verse that we defer to when we talk about this subject, this term of apologetics, is 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. And uh, we know that verse. You've probably heard it many times. But look what it says there. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you of the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so uh, apologetics then comes from this verse here where it talks about to give an answer. Look at that phrase there where it talks about to give an answer. And really, this is the Greek word apologia, apologia, okay? Answer, apologia. Peter says we always have to be ready to give an apologia. And by the way, this is where we get our word from, our English word. What does it sound like? Somebody tell me. Apology? Did somebody say that? Apology? To apologize? 
And so you're saying, well, are you saying then, Pastor Harmon, that we have to apologize for being Christians, going all over the place saying, you know, please excuse me for being a Christian. I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. You know, obviously that's not what that word means there. But of course, we do get our word apologize from that. But the word actually means a defense. Now, some of you might have been here when uh, James Walker was here. We had him here back, I think it was in February, who works for or serves under Watchman Fellowship. And he referred to this verse And he referred to this very word here. I don't know if you remember it, but one of the things that he said, which is so very true, is that this word is a technical word that was used basically in the Greek and Roman law courts. And it's a word that means defend or defense. It was used by an attorney who was going to defend his client. And so uh, it refers then to a speech given in defense of someone or something. In fact, this word is used nine times in the New Testament. Let me give you a few verses. Acts 22, 1. Here's Paul, and he says this, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. This was Paul standing before a group of of angry Jews when he went into Jerusalem. And uh, they were ready to really, um, you know, kill him. And Paul said, hold on, let me give you a defense. Let me give you my position. Let me tell you about my life and why I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also used in Acts 25, verse 16, where it says where Paul had an opportunity to make his defense against charges that were rendered against him. In 1 Corinthians 9, 3, Paul uses this word again, where he says, my defense to those who examine me is this. Now, Paul is being criticized by the Corinthian church. Can you imagine a church criticizing Paul, the apostle Paul? But they were, they were making criticisms against him. And Paul says, okay, let me give you my apologia. Let me give you my defense to the church. Why do I do what I do? Uh, it was also used another place is in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul says, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now, you might remember the context of that, where the apostle Paul uh, is, is in Rome. He's in a Roman prison. He's under house arrest. He can entertain visitors, people that come and could come and see him. But he always had a Roman soldier chained to him. And Paul was there for two years. He was waiting to appear before Caesar in a court case. Well, we think our courts are all jammed up. Paul had to wait two years there in a Roman prison. And, and he was going to give a defense for the gospel before Caesar himself. And again, this is the word that he uses here uh, in, in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 7. The Philippians were writing to Paul. They were concerned about his situation. And Paul says, look, when I go and I stand before Caesar, I'm going to have you in my heart. You're going to be there with me. And, uh, and when I make this defense, you know, I could live. If I live, it's Christ. I could die. If I die, it's gain. But I, I you know, to depart is far better but I have this confidence that I'm going to still remain here with you. And so this was the word that he used in that context. It's a word for defense or there, apologia. And so Peter is using this same word in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and he's using it not just for himself. He's using it for every Christian. Again, look, read the verse again, 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. Now, who is he talking to here? He's talking to all believers, all believers. And so apologetics is something that all of us have a responsibility to engage in. How many would say amen to that? Amen. We all have to give a defense. A defense of what? A defense, and we're going to look at this context in this verse closer, but a defense for Christianity. How many of you know that we're living in hostile times? We're living in times when when the world is not very friendly to the gospel. It's not very friendly to the church, especially if you stand firm on the scripture. The The world does not believe what we believe about the Bible, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Therefore, it is our authority, and we stand on this without apology. Um, but we have to be able to give a defense in this world today. And so I would just say this, and I, I say this to my theology class, my Friday morning theologians. I, I said it to them. I said it to my other classes. Uh, did you know that everyone is a theologian? Everybody here has a theology. Did you know that? You're either a good theologian or you're a bad one. 
because everyone believes something about God. Everyone has some set of ideas about God. The question is, do they harmonize with the Scripture? So you are a theologian. You're either a good one or you're a bad one. And I would use the same phrase with reference to apologetics. Every person in here, you are an apologist. You're either a good apologist or you're not a good apologist or you're not so good. But God has called all of us to be able to stand up in the face of a hostile world and to give an answer for what we believe and why we believe it. And so the question I would like to ask you is that, you know, are you able to do that? Uh, again, Peter is insisting that the believers must understand what he believes and why one is a Christian, and then be able to articulate one's beliefs humbly, thoughtfully, reasonably, and biblically. Um, so we have to be able to do that as Christians. Now, uh, our example in this, uh, of course, is um, the Apostle Paul himself. Uh, Paul was an apologist. Uh, it was Paul's custom into every village that he went to go first to the synagogue and be involved in dialogue or to reason there with people. And when Paul was presenting the gospel, the very first place he would go into a town is he would go into a synagogue. That was uh, uh, the logical place to go because there was already a gathering of a, of a group of people there. And normally uh, the way he would identify a synagogue was they were normally set on the highest elevation in a town. That was generally true. They had a pole that went straight up, just like, you know, here in America, you can look for steeples and know there are churches, right? Back then, you go into a town, look for a pole, and you could find a synagogue, and Paul would go in there, and he would reason with them. In fact, Acts chapter 17, verse 2 says this, and Paul, as his manner was, this was what he would do, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So Paul would open, and the word there has the idea of he would open the scriptures to them. Uh, they're in the synagogue. And he, the Bible says, and um, also if you back up there, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Opening has the idea of laying one verse next to another. He would go verse by verse one verse after another, and he would just basically take the topic of the Messiah, go from one verse to another, and he would reason with them. Uh, he would, in a, in a sense, defend what he believed about the Lord Jesus Christ to a group of people that didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And then also the word alleging is, where, is from where we, get, where, where we get our word dialogue, dialogue, dialogamos is the word there, where we get our word dialogue, and what is a dialogue? That involves how many people? Two people, right? It's talking back and forth. That's what you're supposed to do when I ask you a question. You're supposed to talk back to me. This is a dialogue here, all right? I ask you a question, you say yes or no. Everybody understand that? All right. No, someone said no. Uh, so anyway, thank you for that contrary view. That helps. Uh, just kidding. Anyway, um, so, and actually, I, I want to do that with you. I want you to ask me a question if you have a question. Give me a thought or a comment on this. But, and so all of us then are called to be apologists like Paul where we dialogue with people and we're able to give an answer for the things that we believe. Um, and again, this is very important in the world in which we live today. You know, there was a time when I, I would go soul winning and uh, knock on doors, and you can start sharing the gospel with a person. And when you did that, you had a, a presupposition that you carried with you, and that presupposition was this, that this person believes in God. We assume that they just believe that there is a God. You can't make that assumption anymore because we live in such a postmodern world where even the existence of God is under question. And as Christians, we have to be able to even give answers about that. Uh, and then that, that why we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And so, um, and so we have to follow the pattern of the Apostle Paul, and that is to meet people where they are. 
and then bring them along. Whenever Paul talked to the Jews, you know what he did? He would, he would start into the Old Testament scripture and he would compare scripture after scripture because he knew that they believed that there was a God and they believed the same God that he believed in. It's that they didn't embrace the Messiah. So Paul started with the Hebrew scriptures. But when Paul spoke to some of the Greeks, he didn't necessarily start there in the um, Old Testament. In fact, if you look at the occasion where Paul spoke at Mars Hill, um, that was back in Athens. That was the place where Greek philosophers would go to compare their ideas. Paul would, Paul would go, um, and, you know, again, here's the pattern. He would go to the synagogue. If they didn't believe at the synagogue, he would kind of shake the dust off, and then he would go to the Agora, which is called the marketplace. And in this case of Athens, where he went after the synagogue, as he went to the Acropolis, where there was the Parthenon that was there, and uh, there, that was the, the location of Mars Hill, which is recorded in the book of Acts. And, uh, and Paul engaged the Greek philosophers there, and he met them on their own ground of philosophy, and Paul was able to then point to the fact that there is a creator, a God. So he started where they were. And I think that's the thing that we have to understand, that in apologetics, we have to start where people are and bring them along, and we have to be able to give an answer to uh, people about our, our beliefs in the world today. That's why apologetics is so very important. So let's talk about um, apology at the end of an apostolic age, because we know that during the time of the early church, the apostles and the believers... They were apologists. They defended the faith. But at the end of the apostolic age, uh, there rose other men that we could say were apologists. For example, there was Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr in the second century uh, wrote his famous Apologia, and it was addressed to the emperor Antonius Pius. And uh, the reason he wrote that is because there were all kind of lies that were being spread about Christianity and Christians. And Justin Martyr, by the way, we call him Justin Martyr because he ended up dying for his faith. That's the part of apologetics I didn't really tell you about. You might die for the faith. Just kidding. Um, but, you know, we might be called upon to suffer. But Justin Martyr, um, who was formerly an agnostic, uh, began to read the scripture, came under conviction, got saved, became such a strong believer, became a great apologist in the uh, apostolic at the end of the apostolic age and uh, basically he wrote this work to the emperor because of all these lies that were being circulated about Christianity we could say it like this pagan scholars rose up to challenge the church and early apologists like Justin Martyr met the challenge head-on using reason and evidence and so in each period since Christian apologetics have met Christianity's detractors with, respectable, with respectful and well-formed arguments. And so this is what uh, we're being uh, called to do in the Scripture. We have to be able to answer questions. And, uh, and we'll talk about this as we go on, but what was the task of the apologists was to clarify what was really being proclaimed by the Christian church. Um, and this is what Justin Martyr wanted to do. He wanted to clarify uh, he desired to clear up false conceptions that were rumored and spread abroad. Uh, for example, did you know that it was commonly said in the beginning of the second century that Christians were a seditious group, that they were trying to overthrow uh, the Roman Empire? That was one of the, the lies that was put out there against them. They were also called atheists. Do you know why they were called atheists? They were called atheists because they didn't believe in the Roman gods. They believed only in Jesus Christ. Now, in, in Rome, you know, it was okay to believe in Jesus Christ as long as you believe that he was one among many of the other gods. But if you believe that Jesus was the only God, that was a problem there. And that's why they were called atheists. They were called atheists because they refused to affirm that there was any other God other than Jesus Christ. And so they were accused of that. Uh, they were also uh, accused of um, basically uh, being cannibals. You say, why would they be, uh, be accused of that? Well, because they didn't understand what 
the Lord's Supper was, when they said, they, they, when they said that, uh, you know, this is my body and this is my blood, and when they were doing the Lord's Supper, people would overhear that and think these people are cannibals. And so it's these lies and more where Justin Martyr had to rise up and he would defend uh, the Christian faith. And he would say to the emperor in his book, Apologia, he said, look, we're, we're not atheists. We believe in the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the one true God. And secondly, he said, you know, we're, out, we're not out to overthrow the political structures of the day. In fact, part of our religion is to pray for kings and to pray for those who are in authority and to render under Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. And he would say, if you look at our life, you're going to find out that we're, we're model citizens of civil obedience. We obey all the laws. We drive our chariots within the speed limit. I'm not sure that was exactly an argument. We don't break any of the laws. We, we do what we're supposed to do. We are good civil servants. And so Justin Martyr was using them to defend Christianity. Let me ask you a question. Are there lies and mistruths being spread about Christianity today? Are there attacks going against Christianity? Of course there are. And we have to stand up and we have to say, hey, hold on, wait a minute. That is just simply not true. And we have to be able in a very gracious way and in a very reasonable way give an answer to those who rise up in opposition against us. You know, some of you, some of you know that, you know, we've had a little trial with our, our older son, Jeremiah. We love him dearly, but he's taken an errant path. And of course, we're praying over him. And I, as, a, as his father, I've tried to, of course, love him unconditionally, but yet at the same time, not compromise the word of God, not compromise truth. Um, and, you know, I've, I've gotten attacked from both sides. I've gotten attacked from Christians who say you're compromising because I love them unconditionally. And I get attacked from non-Christians who say you're a monster because you don't accept him just the way he is. You know, he's, we we're to accept each other just the way we are. And friend, if we were all right just the way we are, God wouldn't need to have sent his son Jesus to die for us on the cross. If God accepted us for just the way we are, we wouldn't need salvation. We wouldn't need the gospel. We wouldn't need a savior. And so what I've tried to do is to graciously stand on the truth. But one of the lies that I was concerned about that's being pushed by the world is this in this whole ordeal that I've been through is this one lie. And that is that Christian parents, this is what the world wants us to believe, that Christian parents throw aside their erring children. They cast them aside. And they don't love their erring children. And friend, I want you to know that was a big concern because that's what the lie that was being put out there by the world. Oh, oh this, here's this pastor who doesn't love his son because of this path that he's chosen in life. And he's kind of thrown, thrown him to the side. And friend, from the very beginning, that's the one lie that I wanted to make sure it was not true, that we made sure that we showed that that is just simply not true. But unconditional love the way we believe it and unconditional love the way the world believes it is two different things. Unconditional, I can, you know what, I can still love my children and disagree with them. How many know that's okay? How many of you agree with your children in everything? Anybody here? You agree with your children in everything that they do? Okay, nobody. How many of you still love your children even though you may disagree with them unconditionally? But see, that's the thing. <clears throat> the world wants to say, oh, you know, these, these, these bigoted Christians, they throw their children aside. No, we don't. We love them. And we love them so much that we're willing to tell them the truth and not compromise the gospel. Um, and so, but that's a lie. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, we need to expose that as it is, as a lie. And not do it in a mean way or in a, you know, angry way, but in a gracious way, simply reveal that, look, here's the truth. Here's what the scripture says. And here's where we stand. And that was the job of the apologists from the very beginning of the church. And we still need them today. And so what I want to talk to you about then in the time that we have here is how to be a good apologist, how to be a good apologist, because that's really what we're talking about. Remember, I said every person in here, you're called to be an apologist. You're, you have to learn this. 
you have to give a defense for Christianity. And so then there are a few key pr principles, I think, that Peter gives us um, and uh, the word that we can practice these things and become good apologists in the church. And so let me just go over these things with you here. And I would just say, number one, be zealous for what is good. Look in, look in chapter 3, look at verse 13. Now here's Peter. Now let me back up a little bit and give you the context of what's going on here. Peter is writing to a group of believers that are under severe persecution. I want you to keep that in mind. This was a time when, who was on the throne when Peter wrote this letter? Anybody know? See, uh, it, was, it was Caesar. Which Caesar was it? Do we, do we know? Nero. Nero was on the throne. Okay? Now, Nero was a nice guy, right? <laughs> no. He was one of the most vicious, ungodly, merciless emperors there ever was. He was, a, he was psychotic. He was crazy. I mean, he, he had his own mother killed. I mean, he was just, just really crazy and vicious. He did all kind of evil things. And he was kind of a tyrant. He wanted his own way. And uh, as history has it, now I realize there's different versions of this in history. Um, but let me just give you the version I think is the correct one using primary sources. That, that Nero wanted to build a bigger palace for himself. He wanted, to, he wanted a certain area of Rome that was uh, kind of a, kind of a slum-like area. And that meant that these people were going to have to move out and leave, and he was going to use that area to build his palace. And basically, he was voted down by the Senate. Well, Nero didn't like that. So he sent out some henchmen to start a fire. And the fire got out of control. And it just completely burned this whole section of Rome, and many people died. And when everything went wrong on him, people got angry at him. Caesar Nero needed a scapegoat. And so what did he do? He started to blame this new sect of people that were called Christians. He said, they are the ones that did this. They're, they're the ones that are always talking about a baptism of fire. It's this group. And so it was for a time, open season on Christians. And this is the background on which Peter writes here, this letter in 1 Peter. And this is why he says to them, you know, there's all these questions now in Rome, in the city of Rome, circulating about Christianity and Christians. You talk about lies being spread about Christians and Christianity. They're being spread. And they came all the way from Nero himself. And by the way, you're going to find people in high, powerful positions spreading lies about Christianity. That's what happened here in this situation. Nero himself spreading these lies about Christians. And Peter writes against this backdrop, and he tells the believers how to respond. Now, he says a whole lot here about how to respond, but we're going to zero in on this one specific area here because we're talking about uh, being a good apologist. And so Peter's giving some advice on how to answer some of these things, not only just answer with your mouth, but how to live in this hostile environment. How are we to live in a, an environment today that's so hostile against Christianity and against the church? Well, so he's going to give us some keys here. And here's the first thing he says, be zealous for what is good. Look at verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? And uh, again, there, I'm, I'm sure many people were concerned about this dangerous climate. <clears throat> and, and Peter is simply stating a rhetorical question here in verse 13. Is anyone uh, going to harm those who are eager to do good? And the implied answer to this is no, and generally no. In other words, it's generally true that those who are passionate about doing good, it is normally true that those people don't suffer harm. Look at the word followers there in verse 13. This is where we get our it's the Greek word um, where we get our word mimic from, to mimic. If you mimic um, someone, it has the idea of being an imitator. And remember, Christ is the example. He's the one who we follow. We are passionate and zealous of doing good. And so Peter is saying, look, if you live like that, who's going to harm you? So here's the first thing, that in this climate 
this hostile climate in which we live, as we are representing Christ in Christianity, here's the first thing that people need to see in us. They need to see that we are zealous to do what is good and what is right. They need to see that. That needs to be completely obvious to everyone who's watching. They're zealous for what is good. Um, and Peter is basically saying, you know, no one's going to harm you in general if that's true. Now, you're probably thinking, now, wait a minute. What about the martyrs? What about Christians who, were, who, who did good and they were persecuted? This kind of seems like a paradox again. But what I think Peter's saying here is that those who follow, it's generally true that those who follow a path of righteousness are not harmed. But are there exceptions to this general rule? Of course there are. Of course there are. Okay? In other words, we could say another way we could say it is a policy of non resistance disarms the opposition. Again, there may be exceptions. Let me read you what one, one commentator said. He said that it is unusual for most people, even those hostile to Christianity, to harm believers who prove zealous for what is good. But here's the second thing that we can take from this. The worst that a foe can do to a Christian does not give eternal harm. The enemy can injure his body, but he cannot damage the soul. That's the other idea you have to, you have to keep in mind. So it is possible for someone to damage my body, but they can't damage my soul. Um, and in fact, Jesus, he told his disciples um, in Matthew chapter 10, fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And so we are to be bold and doing good, knowing that it's, it's possible that we might suffer some harm, but not eternal harm. And so Write down also Psalm 56, verse 4. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. And so this should give us a boldness for Christ. But in general, Peter's saying, look, if you're zealous for what is good, and it's generally true that you're not going to be harmed. Be zealous for good. But now here's the second thing he says. He's very careful to also balance it out by saying this. Be willing to suffer for righteousness. Because look at the next verse. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Again, Peter's very careful to add, it is still possible that you suffer even when you do good. Okay? So, but, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake. Now, the if there, look at the if. This introduces... Uh, what Greek scholars call a condition of fourth class. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in other words, it's, it's a possibility, is what he's saying. Um, there's no certainty that suffering will happen, but it might. It might. Uh, again, Peter's saying, in general, you, you'll probably be fine, but you might suffer for righteous sake. But if you do, if it does happen, what does he say? What is our attitude should be? Should we get angry about that? Look what it says. But, but and if you suffer for righteous sake, happy are ye. Happy are ye. You should be happy about that. Now, I know that sounds like a contradiction to us. Why would I want to be happy when I'm getting hammered? When I'm people, you know, again, I was talking about this thing that I've been going through with my, my son, um, trying to balance out loving unconditionally but also not compromising truth and i'm kind of getting hit from both sides and there was a point in this whole thing where um i was wondering if maybe it, people were getting the idea that i was compromising the, the word of god because i was trying to you know i'm still trying to affirm and love my son and let him know that i'll never stop loving you but some people were, again were taking that for me being co compromising you know my beliefs about what the Bible says, which I just want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever hear that, I just want you to know that's not true because I will never compromise the word of God. Amen. Not going to do that. Not going to back up once what scripture says. But I was, I was worried because I thought there were some people that, you know, that idea was getting out there. And then 
one morning I read an article online that, that someone wrote about me in a, in a, on a blog. I think it was called Metro Weekly, a newspaper. And the, and, the, and the article was very much an attack against me. And the article basically said, Jeremiah Lloyd Harmon's father preaches anti-gay sermon. You know, and, then it went, and then it went on to talk about the whole sermon. And you know what? The guy must have listened to it because he got it all right in the article. I mean, he, he, he understood it. And it was a blistering attack, but you know what? It really made me happy. And you say, why? Because I was relieved. You know why I was relieved? Because at least they know exactly where I stand. At least they know I'm not compromising the truth. So in a crazy sort of way, that, that article really made me happy. And by the way, all of this, um, my sermons online shot up to thousands. All these people started logging on. And uh, all due to this, edit, this uh, man who wrote this article against me, I need to write him a letter and thank him for that. Thank him for, you know, attacking me. And then thank him for the fact that all my sermons have shot up as far as downloads online. And uh, I, I, I don't want to be known as someone who compromises truth. Again, I don't mind offending people because of my position. I don't want to offend people because of my disposition. Okay? And yet I, I don't want to compromise and so Peter here is saying, look, it might be, and by the way, that's a very small price to pay. You know, there are Christians in other countries that are, that are dying for their faith, that are literally, they take their life in their hands when they meet in certain places. Um, there are certain churches that are being burned down and Christians that are being persecuted for, and they're running for their life. What we suffer here is nothing compared to what others but Peter here is basically saying, look, it's very possible that you might suffer for righteousness sake. And if that happens, happy are you. You should be happy about that. And the word happy here, makarios, it's used to describe the benefits bestowed by someone to another, uh, uh, including good fortune and happiness. And, and Peter, it's like Peter saying, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be blessed. You're headed for a blessed state. God is going to open up and bless you because you have suffered for this, because you stood for truth. So Peter said, really, you ought to be, there's a lot of reasons for you to be happy. And then he said this, uh, remember to be brave. Recognize, first of all, he's saying, look, recognize the blessing. Recognize that if you do suffer for standing for truth and for doing what's right, there's a blessing coming to you for that. But also this, remember to be brave. Look at verse 14 again. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Afraid, phobia, where we get the word phobia. Trouble, terrasso, to stir up, to cause trouble. The idea of agitating. Don't, be, don't fear their, thre their threats or their intimidations. Don't be afraid. Uh, be bold as a Christian. And so we're to be zealous for what is good. We're to be willing to suffer for righteousness, if, if, if so called upon to do that, it may be that God might call upon you in some way to do that. But then here's the third thing. Um, be completely devoted to Christ. I already had that up there, didn't I? Okay. You guys need to correct me when I mess up up here, all right? No, just kidding. Number three, be completely devoted to Christ, all right? Look, at, look again in verse 15 what it says. But sanctify the Lord God, in your hearts. Look at that word sanctify there. That is not a suggestion. In the Greek, this is an imperative. How many of you remember what I said about Greek verbs? They kind of carry the weight in every verse. So normally when you study a verse, you're looking for the Greek verb, and you're looking for what mood is that verb. Is it indicative? That's the mood of fact. Is it subjunctive? That's the mood of a possibility. If it's an imperative, that's a mood of command. Here's God commanding us to do something. He's not stating a fact. He's not giving a suggestion. He's giving a command. Here's a command from God. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And the word sanctify here, hegiazo, where we get the word holy from, we could say it like this, to count as holy. Count God as holy, to set God apart. And this is the same word used in the Lord's Prayer. Remember Jesus when the disciples asked, Lord, teach us to pray? 
And Jesus said, okay, then pray after this manner. He didn't say, say these same words. He said, here's the basic way. Here's a manner to pray. Here's the outline of prayer. You, when you pray, say this, our Father which art in heaven, what's the next phrase? Hallowed be thy name. Now, saying it like that, it might sound like it's a petition. But again, that word there in the Greek, it is an imperative. It's, got, it's a command. <clears throat> and what is Jesus saying? When you pray, remember this, hallow God's name. Don't, he's not, again, he's commanding, you hallow God's name. Or we can say it like this, Father, may your name be hallowed. May I always recognize that I must treat you as holy. And listen, I think this is one of the biggest points in being, we're talking about being a good apologist. If you want to answer the world, if you want to give an answer for what we believe in the face of a hostile world, and Peter's given us some, some, some suggestions here, but I think this is the most important. He said, be zealous for what's good, be willing to suffer for righteousness, be completely devoted to Christ. You better make sure that you hollow the name of God. You better treat him as holy. You better treat his name as holy. Um, and I think this is in the way in which we live our life. How many of you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're able to answer with great intellect, with great ability to argue and philosophy and philosophize about things. If you're brilliant in your answers for Christianity, and yet when people look at your life, they see that you're not living a life that hollows the name of God. What, what kind of apologist does that make us? We're not very good because you know what the world will say about us? Well, they, they talk well, but look at their life. Look at the way they live. We hollow the name of God in the way that we live. We treat him holy in, in, in everything we do every day. Do we hollow God's name? And by the way, I think this is what it means when it says, don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. What is taking the name of the Lord God in vain? It is calling yourself a Christian and yet living like you're not one. You've taken his name in vain. So if you're going to be a good apologist, you better learn how to sanctify the Lord God in your heart. They, and when a person looks at your life, they better see that there, here's someone that is living up to what they really profess. They see that you are devoted, you're absolutely devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they see that you treat God with absolute reverence and respect and holiness, even in the way that you live your life, even in the way that you, you, you uh, go to work, the way you drive your car, the way you treat debts that you owe others, all those things are a reflection on how we hallow the name of God. And here's the thing, as Christians, we need to portray a high view of God in everything that we do. And I think that in the church, to some extent today, we've, we've, we've forgotten this. We've lost this. Do we portray a high view of God? Sometimes people will say, you know, Pastor, how come, <clears throat> how come we don't do this? You know, this other church down here, they do this, and boy, it really works. And how come we don't do this? And I'll, sometimes my answer will be, well, because that doesn't really portray a high view of God doesn't portray a high view of God. What, is, what are we saying to the world about God when we do that? You know, I, I've, I've at times seen some, some of these guys standing on the street corner with a bucket with a cross on it asking for donations for their church. And I always want to stop. I don't do this, but I always want to stop and say, hey, man, don't do that, please. What are, what are you portraying about God? You know, that God has to go to the world to support his ministry? That doesn't portray a high view of God. God, you know what? God takes care of his work. He doesn't need the world's help to take care of his ministries. That doesn't portray the view of God that we want to portray. And this is what Peter is saying here, that look, you better make sure as an apologist that your life it treats God as holy, that you sanctify the Lord God in your heart, that when they see you, not only must it be the answer of your lips that you give for Christianity, they need to see a person completely devoted to Christ, sanctifying the Lord God in your heart. 
have you done that? Now, I, I said that I wanted to make this kind of like a class where you can give me some input. So are there any questions or comments so far? Anybody? You want to have a question or a comment? Anyone here? We have a microphone up here. You can contribute. We have a gentleman over here. Someone want to grab that microphone and run it over to this gentleman over here? <clears throat> So this is, uh, this is good that we do this. How many remember Pastor Johnson used to do this a lot in his class? I used to love this part of his, his Bible class where people were able to ask a question. We had two people, one gentleman and this dear lady here. That's okay, either one, that's fine. Ladies first. Yes, ma'am. Is it on? It's on. Hold it up nice and close to talk into okay. it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to be blunt. What about the Christians who beat up other people across the head with the Bible. And you know, they, they come off fire, brimstone, everything you do is wrong, da 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 da. And, you know, they have a, yeah. really, they come at you in a yeah. negative way, you know, right. uh, uh, judging you and all. Right. Right. I mean, and, and really, those are the ones who turn people off away from God and Christ because of it. But, but, but I have to have, I have an extended family. Yeah. I've got distant cousins. And I have one yeah. cousin who's yeah. done that. Yeah. And I said, you know, you may want to tone it down because you're turning people away from the Lord and you're coming off like this. And, you know, and also, what about the things you have done yeah, it's wrong a good, it's a that, good that question. people don't know about? Yeah, it's a good I'm question done. because we see that a lot, right? Where we can become so zealous for truth that we become angry almost in the way that we, we do it. And, again, I would go back to what I said. I don't mind people being... Uh, uh, disagreeing with me because of my position, but I don't want them disagreeing with me because of my disposition, the way I speak truth. And that's, there should be a gentleness and a respectful tone to the way that we answer. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, sometimes uh, one of the things that I've had to be careful of in my own life is anger. Because honestly, error does make me angry. How many are like that in here? Error makes you angry, and lies make me angry, but we need to be very, very careful that we don't um, come across in the way that you just spoke, because it doesn't help the cause of Christ. What does the Bible say in James? The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You don't get anywhere with being angry. And um, I think to a certain extent, angry fundamentalism has really hurt the cause of Christ. And so we need to speak the truth in love and gentleness and, um, and be careful about our spirit. Go ahead. We had another gentleman over uh, here. Yeah, I just had a question about the uh, word fear in that verse. Yeah. Uh, does that also mean respect, that word? Um, it, it, can, it can mean that. And uh, the thing about Greek words, like our English words, that the same word can have a different nuance of meaning depending on the context that, in which it's used. And so this word phobio, where we get our word pho phobos or phobia, is a word that generally means uh, to be afraid of. But it can have the nuance of reverence to it depending on the context of the, of the passage. And, and again, that's true with a lot of Greek words. We have to look at the context of it and how it's used there. So Yes, it can mean respect and reverence there. Yes, good question. We have another gentleman back here. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to add a scripture um, to what's being taught. Um, if you look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it lets us know that Christ suffered here on earth. Now you must be ready um, to suffer as he did because suffering shows that you have stopped sinning. It means that you have turned from your own desires and want to obey God for the rest of your life. Now, that's how mine is reading in my translation. I just wanted to add that to um, when you were talking about suffering for doing good, that we need yeah. to have a ready mind and know that in this earth, yeah. as he suffered, we could face suffering also. Right. Exactly. Uh, Very good I point. I just wanted to add that. That's all. Very good point. That's good. Anybody else? Okay, so uh, as we, we push on here, be completely devoted to Christ. Let me give you the next thing here. Be prepared to give an intelligent argument. Look again at what it says in verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer 
to everyone that asks you of the reason of the hope that is in you. And so we have to be ready. And the word be ready here literally prepared. And again, this is taken in the imperative sense because so Peter's giving us a list of commands here. He says, number one, you treat God as holy. And also you be prepared. Be prepared to give an answer. Now, what does that require on our part? Um, that means you have to study, doesn't it? Doesn't that imply that? You have to, you have to study. Um, this means you, know, you have to know more than just a little, excuse me, just a little about the Bible. You have to, you have to dig into the Scripture. Um, someone wrote this. It said, the tragedy of the hour is that there are so many folk who say they are Christians, but the skeptic is able to tie them up into 14 different knots. Um, and I think I'm afraid that sometimes that's true. And why is that true? It's because we, we don't know the Scripture the way we need to. And so you know that the, the Christian life is a call to study. Did you know that? The Christian life is a call to study. What time is it, by the way? Good night. Got two more, two more minutes here. Um, you guys are not listening fast enough in this class. You're going to have to do better. Just, I'm just kidding. Um, and so um, the Christian life is a call to study. The word disciple itself is from the Greek word uh, mathetis. It's where we get the word math. I, I hated math in school, I'll be honest with you. But the word math has the idea of, you know, learning. And so the Christian life is all about being a learner. And we're to be students. What does the Bible say? Study to show thyself what? Approved unto God. And if you're going to be a good apologist, you're going to have to study the Scripture because you have to be prepared to give an answer. And again, this is a command from God to us. And I'll close this. I remember I was a teenager. I just... I, I, first got saved, I, we went out in our, in our church van, and uh, we were being dropped off to go visit and go soul winning. I'd learned how to share the gospel. We were dropped off in this certain neighborhood. I can still picture it in my mind. I know the very street. where I, It was years ago when I was a teenager. Knocked on the door. It was right around dinner time. I'd say probably around 6.45 or so. Knocked on the door. Man, the man answered the door. They were eating, but the man said, you know, come on in my living room, sit down, invited me in. His family continued to eat at the table, and we had a discussion. And he was a very intelligent gentleman. And as I began to share the gospel, he came up with things, questions that I couldn't answer. And I remember I tried to answer, and it was very obvious that his whole point was he wanted to win arguments. And I was ill-prepared to answer those arguments or to even address some of the questions that he had. And I remember... After that was over, I felt like a total failure. I felt like, man, I wasn't able to help this guy. And so I just was discouraged. And I determined right then, that's never going to happen to me again. I'm going to study. I'm going to get myself ready. A year later, and this is the truth. I know it sounds like I'm making this story up, but I'm not making it up. We went to the same neighborhood. I got dropped off on the same street. Knocked on the same door. At the same time, he answered the door. They were eating dinner. He invited me into the living room. And we went through this same discussion. Deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra says. And we went through this same discussion. This time, however, I was able to give him an answer to all the questions that he had. And I, I, and I remember, when, even when I was leaving there, I remember him saying, you know what, you're not the same guy that was here a year ago, are you? And I wasn't trying to win an argument. Folks, it's not about winning arguments. It's about winning people to Christ. And you know what? All we can do is we can lay out the evidence. We lay out the evidences of Christianity. And once we've done that, our job is over. I can give the proof, but I can't give the persuasion. That's up to the Holy Spirit of God, right? But we have to be ready to give an answer, a compelling answer. Just lay out the truth. They might not agree with it. They may even argue against it, but once you've laid the truth out, we back away because then that's when the Holy Spirit takes the truth and he's the one that does the work of persuading that person of the truth. We don't have the power to do that. So we have to, however, be ready to give 
an intelligent answer. And then here's the last thing. I'll just say this. Be careful to maintain a good conscience, Peter says uh, in this. Be careful to maintain a good conscience. And this theme runs throughout uh, his whole letter. But again, it's the idea of don't be a bad witness. Make sure that you never uh, go against your conscience in the way in which you live. All right, we're, we're done. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we have to go to our service. Let's bow for prayer together. And so, Father, thank you for this time that we've had in your word this morning. I pray that, Lord, you'll bless us as we continue on this subject next week. Lord, make us good apologists of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you.